we don't know even basic business strategy around that. It's very virgin territory. And on my last slide, uh, this is really where I dumped all of the most common questions I have around telemedicine. I'm focusing around telemedicine on this one because it's what I talk to people a lot about in my healthcare focus, but it also springs more into consumer healthcare very quickly. Um, my number, only numbers on the slide is just a basic number to show even this is a mature, you know, healthcare market. We're not talking IT, we're not talking any of these very peripheral markets. Um, remote monitoring is still vastly growing vastly superior to, to other mature spaces. Um, policy trends we've talked about before, I won't uh, dwell on that too much. There, there are um, incentives in place for people with uh, healthcare IT, but there's not a whole lot of incentive right now uh, at all for remote monitoring and telehealth. Um, the definitive answer to is telemedicine covered by insurance? The definitive answer is not really no. Um, the only, uh, there are some exceptions to this um, some accept, and, and, and everyone can give you an example, there's a lot of exceptions, but the definitive answer is no. Um, for video telemedicine, for example, there are forms of insurance. For um, post-discharge visits, in you know, a time when a patient is discharged from a hospital, there has been long-standing tradition of monitoring that patient in the home, but the idea now is to not have the nurse physically go to the patient's home, but actually remotely monitor it through, through technology. Um, that has a form of reimbursement as well called post-discharge. Uh, studies around, the, or study outcomes right now. For outcomes data, for clinical outcomes, if the patient is doing better because of these technologies and services, um, there's very strong evidence around this. The most recent was the Veterans Healthcare Administration has done large-scale studies, um, uh, 17,000 patients. Um, which is what a lot of people were, were waiting for, a large-scale pseudo-randomized study. And the results on outcomes were very positive, 25% um, reduction in bed days for, of care. Um, cost savings, on the other hand, there, there's a lot of micro-scale studies that are, are, show a little bit of uh, positive data, but when it comes to the definitive answer, there's, there's not a lot on, on a big scale. Uh, the VHA study doesn't really show on a big scale cost savings sometimes. And questions like what part of the Medicare payer system is saving money? Is it Medicare? Is it Medicaid? Is it private insurers? Uh, is, it, is it somewhere else in the chain? And also what department within the hospital um, really, really shows that, that, that savings? Is it that, you know, of course, if you're keeping people out of the critical care room, maybe your regular visits are going to go up quite a, quite a bit because people are taking care of themselves better. Um, but, but, but that's my, uh, my common questions here. I'm sure we'll have more in a little bit. Uh, Doug McClure is our next speaker. Doug is uh, with uh, Center for Connected Health, which is part of Partners Healthcare in uh, Boston. Uh, Doug serves as a corporate manager for technology and operations. He's uh, responsible for a lot of the things that's going on over there, which is some really exciting stuff. Uh, manages uh, their Smart Beat, I guess, remote monitoring program. We may talk a little bit about that. He's also has been active with uh, my organization, which I believe one of our founders of the technology interest group. So, uh, Doug, I'm sure you can have a lot more to say about these things. Great. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Zachary, I share the challenge, right? We wanted to uh, try and keep our presentation short so we can get engaged in a dialogue. So I have just a few slides to try to encompass a whole heck of a lot of activity that's going on at Partners Healthcare. Um, so let me be clear, Partners Healthcare is a care delivery organization, right? That means we have hospitals. Some of them are brand names that people would have heard of, like Massachusetts General Hospital or Brigham and Women's Hospital. We also have home care services, et cetera. Now, this makes us on the, uh, there have been a couple of, couple of nice slides today about the triangles intersecting, right, one side versus the other. I think that's really important to understand is there's healthcare, and then at the other end, there's wellness. And in the middle, you might call some of this stuff disease management. And when you pull apart the markets, actually the way all of it gets paid for is different from where you are in how the triangles intersect. 
And this is a challenge. It's a challenge especially for a healthcare organization like Partners, which has uh, very traditionally been how do we get reimbursement for care that we deliver in our hospitals and in our clinics. So a little bit of what I'm going to share with you quickly this morning is kind of a couple of stories, right? Stories that use the same technology over and over again, but really uh, in the end are the same process. And what we're going to find is that healthcare delivery, as we're thinking about in a remote monitoring way, and wellness are not all that different, but we have to figure out how to leverage this common inner uh, infrastructure to get at a common good and then figure out how to get it paid for. So, all right, we think of Connected Health as really uh, having four cornerstones. One, that you have to have uh, accurate physiologic information. If you ask Doug how much he weighs, he'll tell you 200 pounds. You get him on a scale, 225, right? That is the difference between overweight and obese. It is the difference between some uh, serious health care issues and, and maybe even more serious health care issues, right? Real outcomes difference here. So you have to have objective truth around numbers. Two, you have to get Doug engaged in that conversation, right? You have to engage him in what does this number mean? mean? Now, weight is an easy one, uh, but we've done lots of work around blood pressure, and you'd be amazed how much misunderstanding there is about what is a good blood pressure number. Is 120 over 80 good? That seems like it sounds good. How bad is 140 over 90, right? How bad can 160 over 95 be? doesn't seem like it's that big a number. So you have to get people engaged in understanding what those numbers mean. Three, you have to aim all this conversation at trying to achieve some common care goals, right? Uh, so for Doug, it might be that he's going to kind of trim some of those extra pounds off so that he can avoid problems down the line. Other people, it might be we're going to bring their blood pressure under control, or it might be helping uh, people with type 2 diabetes get to control of their blood sugars. gathering to aim it through a coaching model that drives behavior change. And that's the last piece, is to think about how we can leverage providers at the right time and in the right way in order to get that behavior change that enables each of us to do a better job of taking care of ourselves. So with those four cornerstones, we end up with models where we take care of patients that have heart failure, right? Uh, these are very sick patients that uh, come out of the hospital and uh, go home and then oftentimes they end up right back in the hospital and that readmission is a very expensive proposition and the way we do really significant reduction in their blood pressure right now we can spend a lot of time pulling all those numbers apart what was it was it the cool blood pressure device was it the cool website was it the uh, way the data uploaded was it the automated coaching we don't know yet and that's the research path that's out ahead of us all as we move forward but the important thing to understand is this is a program that begins to look lo more like disease management and almost wellness services as opposed to something around healthcare delivery that we were thinking of for our heart failure patients. But the technologies being used are exactly the same. All right, so let me share the one that kind of bridges right over to where we are today, where we're really talking about wellness services. So this is a program around activity and weight monitoring. So these are patients, uh, I'm sorry, they're, I'll take that back. They're not patients anymore. They're program participants. These are not patients of Partners Healthcare. These are people who uh, um, their employer has decided that they're going to offer out a benefit where they can get engaged in a uh, activity and weight loss program. Same kinds of technologies, right? Some monitors, whether they wear them, step on them, et cetera, data flows. It ends up in a system where, as you can see, the individual can interact with that information, get engaged in it. There's an automated coaching engine behind there, kind of helping people understand how well they're doing. Uh, and in the end, what we're after is the outcomes, right? Do people actually get more active and lose weight? Same technologies, same processes, different part of those intersecting triangles that have come out. Uh, so this program is live today. So let me, uh, let me finish up quickly so we can get to the discussion and just say, if we think about what the numbers are, right? If I shared with you that we have 275 or so congestive heart failure patients that we're monitoring at any given time right now, 
and the number of hypertensives and diabetics that we're monitoring, uh, type 2 diabetics, uh, around partners right now, that number comes in at about 200 or so, right? Uh, when I share with you the wellness programs that we're beginning to deliver out, those numbers...